This episode of Defining Diabetes is sponsored by our newest sponsor, the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. This is the blood glucose meter that Arden has been using for well over a year, maybe a year and a half. And it is, without a doubt, no bull, the best, most accurate blood glucose meter Arden has used in what is now 14 plus years of diabetes. 14? Hold on a second. I got a little math to do. She's two when she's diagnosed. She's 15 now. She's almost 16. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Or I lost count. 14, it's like 13 years. What did I say? It's been so long I forgot what I said. She's 15. And she was diagnosed when she's two. Anyway, she had a lot of meters since then. A lot of years, a lot of meters. This one is, without a doubt, absolutely the best. You know what? I'm just going to tell you why right now. Sample size, not a lot. If you miss with your little, like, you know, you touch the blood, you know, sometimes you touch it and it doesn't work. That doesn't waste a strip. You have a nice long time to put it back on again and get more blood without affecting the test. That, of course, amazing. If you want, the Contour Next One has a app that comes with it, which is a darn handy. You can check that out. I can tell you from personal experience that Arden has never had a meter that has more closely and more frequently agreed with her Dexcom G6. Really gives you a lot of good feeling when that happens. The meter is an industry leader in accuracy, and I will actually share some of those numbers with you in a future episode. The app, by the way, is available on the Google Play Store and the App Store. The Contour Next One is compatible with Apple Health, and those of you using an Omnipod Dash, the Contour Next One will send the information right into the Dash. Magic. Bluetooth magic. All right, listen. For now, I want you to go to ContourNextOne.com. Now, Contour, spelled the classic way, C-O-N-T-O-U-R. Next, again, only one way to spell next. One is the word, not the digit. So, ContourNextOne.com. Head over there today, check them out. But, you know, if you're going to do it, use the link in the show notes or the one that you'll find at JuiceBoxPodcast.com. Get Arden's meter today. It is spectacular. Jenny Smith is back today. Jenny and I are going to define insulin resistance. And it's not exactly the way you think of it, which is why we're bothering to take the time to talk about it. We're not just like, woo, pick something everybody knows. You think you know about insulin resistance. Jenny going to shine a bright light, a bright light on what it means. While you're listening to Jenny spin her genius, try not to forget that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise and that you should always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. I could say that in my sleep, by the way. All right, I'm not going to make you uh, beg. We're going to get right to Jenny. Don't forget, by the way, if you want to hire Jenny, she works for Integrated Diabetes. You go to integrateddiabetes.com to find out about Jenny. Jenny is not a sponsor. Jenny is my person, so I don't get anything out of it if you go except good feelings. So you can go through my link if you want. If it makes it easier for you, you can just type it right into the browser. Don't matter. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I would like to define insulin resistance. Insulin resistance. That's a good one. A very good one. And I'll tell you why. Why does this one come up on my list? It's because, again, I think it's the same thing as brittle in in a different in a different avenue of the same idea. Maybe not always, but I think I think there's insulin resistance and there's reasons for it. But first, can we define it? Sure. I mean, insulin resistance is essentially the body's pushback. A simple, I guess, simple definition: the body's pushback in appropriately using insulin, right? It's just not, it it appears that insulin is just not working the way that it's supposed to on people with insulin resistance and that, which is that technically a hallmark of type two diabetes Mm -hmm. is insulin resistance. Cause in the early phases of type two development, there's actually a huge output of the pancreas producing more insulin, like loads of insulin to actually overcome the higher blood sugar levels. 
but their body's cells are not responding to the insulin the mm-hmm. right way. So the body just keeps pumping out more and more and more insulin. And even- eventually with type two, the pancreas gets pooped out. I mean, those cells are like, God, we just, we can't put out like more and more and more. We're doing enough and it's just not working. Okay. It's a bit different in type one diabetes. I mean, there are, there are some hallmark like diagnostic reasons for true insulin resistance in type one. Um, one of them is weight management. Okay. The the heavier that you are above your body's like target healthy weight, the more resistant you're going to be to using insulin. The insulin is just not going to work as well in, in the body. Um, another one specific to women is something called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that, that actually causes um, a whole like series of metabolic changes, one of which, however, is insulin resistance. Um, a woman with PCOS will usually need a lot more insulin to manage and it's based on a hormonal component Mm -hmm. to the ovarian syndrome that's kind of going on. Um, So in general, though, insulin resistance with type 1 diabetes, if you are, you know, if you're healthy weight, um, active and whatnot, everybody's insulin needs are very different. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about insulin resistance, I think a lot of people might look at a friend of theirs who's the same height, weight, you know, doing the same kinds of things. And you're like, well, why am I using double the amount of insulin as them? What's the deal? I must be insulin resistant. That's not the case at all. I mean, I've got a friend who's actually, she's tiny. Um, She's had diabetes several years longer than me. And I've had it 31 years. And she actually uses more insulin than I use. She's only five feet tall and she probably weighs 10 or 15 pounds less than I weigh. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) I mean, but she uses, and she's very active. Um, she's actually roller derby. She's done a couple of like full distance Ironman, you know, events. And so in that, I think sometimes there's a lot of confu- confusion around how much insulin should I personally be using? Okay. It's different for everybody. Gotcha. Okay. So I brought it up. Because, and Jenny, can we slide your phone slightly away from the microphone? I think it's yeah, possible absolutely. we're picking up a little thing. I brought it up because I know it's a real thing, and I wanted you to explain what yeah. it really was. But I also know that people default to saying it too frequently when I don't think that that's what's going on, right? So great example would be if you're dehydrated and you know, you're using insulin and it's not giving you the, you know, the response that you expect – then you hear people say, oh, I was, I'm re- I was really insulin resistant today. But you weren't really insulin resistant today. You were really dehydrated today. And right. so, and it, it, because, and the reason I bring it up is because I think the idea of insulin resistance allows people to think this is something beyond my control, so I'll just accept it. Correct. And that's what, that's why I brought it up because that worries me for people when that happens, right? Um, mm-hmm. Great example is I've been helping this really wonderful family recently with a 16 year old boy who's a, you know, an athlete plays a, mm-hmm. a ice hockey. And yesterday the kid went to an ice hockey game and got to play that game like right around like 95 the whole time, you know, didn't crash, awesome. didn't crash low afterwards or anything like that. And I realized that prior to that, they were doing the like, we'll get his blood sugar higher thing. And you know, and he didn't feel well, he feels so much better now. And all this stuff is great. And it's really cool, but they were living in a false narrative before, right? Like, this is what's happening to me, and so I have to accept it, or I have to do this thing that I don't want to do because this is what's happening. And and I don't think people should – well, I don't, th- I don't want to say I don't think. It makes me sad, honestly, when that's happening. You, you know what I mean? Like, I don't like the idea – of someone running around going, oh, my blood sugar was 250 today. I was just insulin resistant when there could have been a real reason for it. So try to right. just keep in your head the difference between what Jenny just explained, what insulin resistance really is. Like, for instance, uh, a pregnant person could use a significant amount more right. insulin, right? Then then they would even have five seconds before they're pregnant or in their first trimester versus their third trimester, like all these different ideas. But that's right. not, that's, so that's that. Okay. So- it just please. And I think a you know. good thing to kind of put in there with that is that 
there may be times when insulin resistance is a piece of what is happening. Like right. you just brought up pregnancy. Right. There is a piece of points in pregnancy where, yes, insulin resistance comes into the picture, but why is it there? It's not that you're going to be insulin resistant for the next 90 years after the child is born. Right. It's the fact that there's a hormone piece in the picture that's causing you to actually, you need more insulin. Right. You, you just, you need the, the hormones are causing that issue. Right. So it's not like a type two where the cellular level of response to insulin is actually a piece of right. it. You're, so, so is it fair for me to say that, like I bring up on the show, your body is, for whatever reason, telling you, I have more of an insulin need in this moment, and you need mm-hmm. to, you just need to meet it. So if you are insulin resistant in that moment, there is enough insulin to use to overcome that blood sugar, right? It just, it gets to a scary point for most people, and they're like, I can't. The numbers get wrong. Right. They, the numbers get wrong in their head. Like I'm usually my my basal is usually a unit an hour, and I've never bolus more than four units for food. So they just won't go bigger than that. Got right. It. And and people who and people who haven't gotten their basal right and done all the things we talk about on the podcast probably shouldn't start crazy bolusing like that because they are going to get right, unbalanced no. and have a harder problem. It, but but the boy, Correct. but the reason I bring up the boy with the hockey is because. He can stay stable while skating and playing hockey now because his basal insulin's right, because he's right. bolusing on time with his meals, because he doesn't have any unbalanced active insulin in his system that just pops up at weird times and, do- and uh, doesn't have a fight with food anymore, so it just kicks his ass instead. Like, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. This is my my yes. my, my, de- my defining diabetes list is about like. All the sad things I hear people say online. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not, no, let's clear that up. No, that's not right. Let's make sure you understand that better. Yeah. 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 I just, I look and I think, oh, it's sad that that's what, 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 what is thought of. Right. Listen, I'll give you a a quick story, right? And then I'll ask you to define overbolusing. I made a diabetes podcast the very, very beginning of 2007. And because of, excuse me, uh, I made a diabetes blog in the very beginning of 2007. And because of the nature of the internet at that point, I didn't really know there were other diabetes blogs. Like there was a little while where I thought to myself, hmm, I am doing something so cool that no one else is doing. Why did no one else think of doing this? I'm a genius. I felt like the Magellan of like diabetes blogs, right? I was just looking around. I'm like, why couldn't, how is Scott's idea so much stronger than everybody? Then I realized there were a couple other diabetes blogs, right? And there had been uh, a number of them preceded mine. I had no idea about them when I started mine, but I had this. I think. I think Carrie Sparlings was one of them. I think she started in 2005 or 2006, if definitely, I remember correctly. Definitely, definitely Carrie. Scott Johnson, probably. Maybe, yep, maybe, Scott's Diabetes. Yeah, maybe George Simmons, too, like if I'm thinking correctly. There were a handful of them. I was in the beginning. I just wasn't the beginning. But I had right. I had this feeling that I, I was, right? And similarly, I do this thing where I avoid other diabetes information. I know that sounds weird maybe when I say it to people, but I don't listen to other people's podcasts. I don't read other people's blogs. I don't want to be impacted by other people because I want to come to these ideas on my own because when I come to them on my own, well, not only that, I can explain it if I know how I got to it. Right. When somebody just tells me, set this there, that doesn't help me. It's like reading a definition out of of a dictionary. Yeah. And then it doesn't help me to help somebody else. So I come up with this idea that we talk about in the podcast here in my house, in my own head. What if I can't pre bolus one day? How do I handle that? And then I came up with that kind of math that you've heard me talk about in other episodes where I'm like, I'll bolus for the, the carbs. And then I'm going to imagine the spike and bolus for the spike. And then I'm going to imagine the correction. I'm going to, I'm going to put it all in right now. And maybe I can get all this insulin so far ahead of that, that like a time travel movie, none of those things will ever happen because I killed the thing before it was supposed to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Literally how I thought of it. And I started speaking about it and I called it over bolusing because I'm over bolusing. You can see how thoughtful I am when I come <laughs> up with words. So 
Um, Pretty fancy term there, over bolusing. Thank you. And so more I, insulin, more over insulin bolusing. over bolusing. Stop the arrows. I am talking to myself like I'm four. And so, um, but anyway, it works. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, here I am again inventing stuff. And then one day you said to me, oh yeah, Gary calls that this. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Yeah. But that completely makes sense that somebody else would have had the thought too. So what I call overbolusing is exactly what I just explained. It's the concept of getting in more insulin than you need for the current situation with the understanding that this current situation is going to get worse soon. And so you get ahead of the problem. Um, but Correct. But Gary calls it super bolusing, right? But Actually, it's John Walsh. John Walsh, um, and we use we use the term. Gary uses the term too, but it originally came from my understanding came from John Walsh, who wrote uh, "Pumping Insulin." Pumping Insulin, okay. Uh, Which, from what yep. I understand from mm-hmm. people, is a really great book. It doesn't. It tell, is. It doesn't it's tell a jokes. Great resource. You don't get to hear Jenny while you're reading it. So, no. I mean, how good Sorry. could it be? Really? <laughs> but, but so okay. it's 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 written in layman's terms. It's a good. Um, I mean, it's not like a bedtime story or anything, but I like it <laughs> from the standpoint of you know one of those books where you can go to a chapter that's like, how do I manage around exercise, or how do I figure out basil, or how do I deal with these spikes post meal and over bolus, right? Right. Or you know people. I think like you, people think about, oh, should I just take more insulin? I know that yesterday when I ate my cereal for breakfast, this is what happened. Well, what if I just took more insulin right now? Yeah. That's the same concept. It's it's over bolusing. It's super bolusing. It's whatever you want to name it. Mm-hmm. It's just you head off the spike by just dosing more earlier. Okay. And so to, to really to break it down, and we've done this in other episodes, but I, I want it to be here as well. Say that you've counted your carbs perfectly, but you have not pre bolus so you know you're going to get a spike, and you decided that the meal is three, you know, three units. But the spike is going to happen because you didn't pre bolus and in your history, you found that that spike's going to go up to 225 before it kind mm-hmm. of pla- before it plateaus and levels off, and you know that it's going to take a unit to correct that 225 back to 90. So then you put in 40 units instead of three. Because you weren't able to pre boss I will, I, I will absolutely tell you that, and I've said this one other time on the podcast, we don't pre boss as much as we used to because I know how to over bolus, right? And it and I don't not do it. I always pre boss whenever I can. But when I can't, I guess I should have said I don't panic the way I used to. Right. I just take care of it right then and there. Mm-hmm. Um and, you know, it's a that's a definitely a another thing that you have to try over time and there's going to be, you know, there's going to be some experimentation. Definitely going to be experimentation for you to figure out. And you know, you, you figured out your super, you're like, I call it secret sauce to over bolusing, right? Mm -hmm. You figured it out and you make it work. And you know, I would say probably 98% of the time you probably nail it because you've figured it out. And in terms of like, you know, that, that one unit you, you said before for the 225 blood sugar. Well, I know it's going to get here. I know it's going to take a unit to correct and bring me down in a mathematical way, just for like definition of how could you figure that out? You can actually sort of back use your correction factor. Okay. And you can say, you know, if I know that I'm going to start with a blood sugar of 100, I'm going to go all the way up to 225. And one unit brings me down 100 points. Your correction factor is 1 to 100, mm-hmm. okay? One unit should drop you 100. You can say, okay, 225, one unit will bring me down to 125. It's pretty close to 100. So let's just give a whole extra unit to the front of this food bolus. Yep. The pump suggested or I calculated three units for the food. I'm going to add on a unit without the time to pre-bolus. Or maybe it's just a really carby meal like cereal tends to be. Mm-hmm. Um and so you head it off with that extra, but that's a little bit of the math if you want a little bit more way to figure it out ahead of time. Um, and then, you know, as we talked before, John Walsh's method with super bolus is really just to take, he does it by taking the basil behind the meal mm-hmm. and he tacks that on to whatever the food based bolus is up front. Yeah. So if you're, you know, if your basil is running at one unit an hour behind the meal for two hours, that's two extra units of insulin. You take that two units, you pop it on to the bolus up front, take it all at one time. And his recommendation is to then take the basil down to zero. 
Mm-hmm. So you're front loading with the insulin, but you're also knocking off the back end effect. So you end up not going low. Yeah. Now, again, there's some experimentation to that as well. There's, I've got some teens um, and young adults and even some kids who taking the basal down to zero, it doesn't work. They end up, the super bolus works. It prevents them from getting like that big spike, but they end up then staying too high later or going up again later because the basal has been taken back to nothing. Yeah, they still need it. So they need some of it. I've got a college student I work with and she does a 50% basal reduction with a super bolus. Okay. So there's some experimentation just like you found with your over bolus thing. (laughs) Um, But yes, that's a good one. Listen, I made that word up in my house and I didn't know anything else existed. So in my mind, I'm again Magellan. You are. For your over bolus word, you are. Yes. And if John Walsh had a podcast, he could tell us about his super bolus, but he doesn't. So that's it. All right. Now, um... (laughs) Oh, correct. For all the people who don't actually get my sarcasm, I feel bad for how angry they must be at me while I'm talking. They're like, that guy. (laughs) Every episode of the podcast should end with Jenny giggling. Thank you so much, Jenny Smith, for coming on the show today and sharing your wisdom with everybody. Don't forget to check Jenny out at integrateddiabetes.com, link in the show notes, and at juiceboxpodcast.com. And of course, our new sponsor, The Contour Next One. You want to do yourself a favor? You want to do something that's not going to cost you a lot of money, but is going to add a ton of confidence and good feelings to you, to your life, to your feels inside. Take away the stress and the anger. Take away everything. The worries go away. Mm, Feel them melting away. Right? You never thought of it before, but a really solid, super easy to use, small, like, you know, put it in your pocket, put it in a bag, no problem. But it's still substantial in your hand, right? Feels well made. You can hold on to it. You know what I mean? It doesn't feel delicate like, oh, I'm going to lose it or it's going to break. It's good. It's solid. It's not big, but it feels good in your hand. I like it. I'm just telling you right now. I don't want to do dirty the other meters that Arden's used over the time, but I'm thinking for there's been a couple and ain't one of them been half. Couldn't hold a candle to the contour next one, my friend. Understand? ContourNextOne.com. Such a simple thing. You've been walking around with this old, dirty, nasty meter that you don't trust for evs. Why are you doing that? So simple to get yourself going with the right one. It's that easy, right? Yeah, you tell your doctor next time you're in the office, yo, yo, how come? I want to get the Contour Next One meter. Make it happen. Write the scrippy script out. Or like I said, ContourNextOne.com. Check that out too. All kinds of ways to upgrade your diabetes. I'm all sorts of jacked up right now. Do you want to know why? You probably don't care. I got to fly tomorrow. Ugh, I hate flying. I'm trying to keep my energy up. I can't wait to get to the JDRF Type 1 Nation event in Oklahoma on Saturday and go in there and do what I think is going to be the magic. All right, I'm going to really whip it out. I think I'm giving like four talks in a day. It's going to be wonderful. I'm super excited about that. Here's the part I'm not excited about. Driving to the airport. Early in the morning tomorrow. Oh, not good. Getting on a plane with sick people. You know they're sick, right? And I'm not a germaphobe, but it's January. It's cold out. You know people like wipe their hands on their nose, and they're going to touch a part of the plane, Then I'm going to touch a part of the plane. Next thing you know, <clears throat> I'm not going to feel good. I don't like that. Then I got to fly somewhere. Now, I don't mind flying, but I hate layovers. And apparently, there is no way to get from where I am to Oklahoma without laying it over. So I'm going to fly north to go, like, I don't really know where Oklahoma is, but I'm, like, southwest, I think I'm probably going, right? Oklahoma. Oklahoma, where the wind comes. Yeah, it's probably, like, southwest. I have to fly north to go southwest. I don't want to do that. Makes me upset just thinking about it. So instead of being upset, I'm keeping up my good energy today. Being excited, having a little bit of fun, trying to keep my focus off of it. I'm going to do my best to put up a couple pictures on the social medias while I'm there. So you, uh, if you're following me on Instagram or Facebook, that's where I would do that. Uh, What else? Yo, are you in the private Facebook group for Bum and the Bold with Insulin Facebook page? And there's like a private group where people talk about management stuff and other good things. Lots of good peeps in there. Go check it out if you want. Got to be something else I want to tell you. Has to be. I'm speechless. When is this going to happen again?
All right, I'm going to go pack and get to Oklahoma. I hope I see you there or at one of my many events coming up. Check them out. Go to um, juiceboxpodcast.com. Scroll to the bottom. Click on events. You'll see where I'm going to be in 2020. Got a lot going on. I think I just added the Phoenix area in May. It's not locked down yet, but I have a good feeling about it. Um, I might be having a good time recording. I don't want to stop, but I have nothing left to say. You're probably pissed now. I'm going to let you go. Goodbye.